Right, I'm going to be honest with you guys, right? I, I'm not a crier, not typically someone who cries a lot. In prepping this, I did genuinely weep a few times. I will probably do so again during the editing process. I hope I don't in any way blub on camera. I'll try and edit it out if I do. And it's going to sound strange because I'm doing so in a video that is talking about the Christian case for the death penalty. So just so you know, this is not going to be like my typical sort of sarcastic edgy thing. This is going to be a little bit different and the reasons for that are going to be obvious in just a few moments. So I want to make the Christian case for the death penalty and I'm going to do so in three parts. The first one is going to be just the sort of common grace, image of God, rational morality. I know that is often corrupted, but nonetheless, I still think it is useful in this discussion. I also want to look at the legal data for this, and I want to look at scripture. Obviously, scripture would trump everything else, but those others are useful. So if you haven't seen the following story, this is the bit that gets me. This child who you're seeing on screen at this moment is called Julian Wood. And this is the bit that really hits home because it's not just you that has a picture of him in front of you. I've got him on my phone here. You can see a picture of him. And he just reminds me a lot of my eldest son at that same age. My eldest son is only a couple of years older than that. He has that sort of look that kids do whenever you tell them to smile and they just show their teeth. He's sort of slightly awkward about it, right? He's got similar hair. He... Clearly, he's got a dinosaur bag, so clearly into dinosaurs, as every good boy that age should be. And you can tell that he's proud because he's just finished preschool. And this is only a couple of weeks old. Sorry. Anyway, he was shopping with his mother. She was putting groceries into her car. And the images that you're seeing now is of a woman called Bianca Ellis. Now, this woman didn't know them at all. There had been no argument, no altercation, no history. She's walking around with a knife and allegedly, I think I have to say allegedly for legal reasons, I'm not sure, but allegedly comes up and stabs them both. Pretty much seems like an open and shut case. The mother ends up in hospital and Julian died pretty much immediately of his wounds. Now, I do believe he is with Christ now. I think there's some biblical warrant for believing that, but nonetheless, this was heinous and motiveless and truly evil what went on. And by the way, there's a YouTube link below this for a GoFundMe for the family. I encourage you to support them in that. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of clips. One is of the father in court and the other is of the alleged murderer, Bianca Ellis, as the charges are read out. Your Honor, that day, one week ago, she took everything from us. There's nothing that could ever replace my son or anything that my wife and I, or even our other kids, are going through. It, it's, it's horrendous. U.S. Code Section 2903.11A1 and or endangering children in violation of a Harvey's Code Section 2919.22B2. Count four alleges that on or about June 3rd, 2024, the defendant did knowingly cause serious physical harm to JW on 10, date of birth 1029-2020. Now, argument one is this. You tell me what should happen to a person like that. Someone who has literally just murdered a tiny child He's at that age, his little personality is just coming out, learning the alphabet, learning to play with his siblings. And not only like does she show no remorse when it's read out, she literally seems to be proud, gloating over her wicked accomplishments. Tell me what the right punishment for someone like that is. And don't give me any of this woke, modern nonsense. Oh, but she's had a hard life. I, I don't care. Like, I don't. I, I don't care at all. Lots of people have hard lives. They don't end up killing little children, right? And what about the hard life that his parents, who are going to be traumatized by this forever, his siblings, who are going to miss him forever, the child who is dead? What about that hard life? I don't care. I don't care. Oh, she's poor. There's lots of poor people in the world. Don't care, right? Oh, but we've advanced as a civilization. Look, a civilization that allows its children to be murdered and the punishment is what? Food and board for the murderer for life? 
That's not punishment. That's not an advanced society. That is a society that is crumbling. That is a society that has lost a biblical view of evil. And one of the things that frustrates me is we are seeing in our world today an epidemic of murderers or other violent criminals smirking and laughing in court. And there's a reason for this, and it's not some sort of criminal insanity thing that's going on. It's that they know that they are not getting properly punished. Let me be clear. A justice system that does not put the fear of God into murderers of little children is not a justice system. The justice is missing. The system needs to very clearly tell people that that smirk will be wiped off your face one way or another. Now, that is the first argument. That's me through the more emotional bit of this. I'll try and keep the rest of it more calm, right? Because I'm annoyed, you can tell. What about the legal argument? I'm told time and time again that the death penalty is not an effective deterrent. And there is a degree of truth in that in the US states in which it still exists. We see that, yeah, murder rates don't necessarily go down. Now, the reason for that, well, there's a couple of them. One of them is that the time between sentencing and the actual executions has gone up significantly. And it was too high to begin with in the 1980s. It was about six years. Today, it is almost 20 years. That is basically not a death sentence. If your doctor tells you you will die maybe in 20 years time, you've not really got like a terminal diagnosis. You've said your longevity is going to be shorter. Also, Almost all death sentences are overturned by other judges. So that's not effective at all. Of course, that's not effective. For justice to be effective, it has to be swift and it has to be guaranteed. A good analogy for this would be the warnings on the size of packs of cigarettes. They don't work either. Doesn't matter how gross you make them. Doesn't matter what pictures you put on them. And the reason is that the consequences of smoking are too distant and they probably won't happen to you, realistically speaking. So people read that, it's white noise to them and they light up whatever. Now, if the reality was as follows, that if you smoke this, you will die tomorrow for sure, you wouldn't need to put anything on the side of packets people would stop doing it pretty much right away. The death penalty is actually effective if a death sentence is a death sentence. If we look at this chart of the rise of murders in the UK, we see that things are very flat and then they begin to rise in the mid 1960s. When did we stop the death penalty for murder in the UK? in the mid 1960s, 1965. Since then, we've had a rising number of murders. And we know this for every other law that if you have a stricter penalty, you tend to have less people doing it. Well, the strictest penalty should be applied to the worst things. Definitely, it's part of the reason why it's rising. Now, people will often push back about wrongful convictions. What do you do there? Of course, there are some cases which are more marginal. Not totally sure what you're supposed to do there, but the standard of evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt. And you do have cases where there's no doubt at all. It is totally open and shut. The Old Testament talks about having two or three witnesses, two independent lines of evidence for something occurring in order for there to be a legal penalty. As far as I'm concerned, I think we should have it. I think we should have it with a high standard, a very high standard of evidence for it. And even if we do that, I do recognize that there may be imperfections. There may be issues. Someone who maybe is innocent might actually get put to death. That'd be terrible. It really would. However, the options are pretty simple on this. You will never have a perfect justice system. What you will have is either where you have very rare accidental injustice or you literally never have justice for the victims of murder. You gotta pick. Okay, now for the more biblical case on this. Now, firstly, I'm making the assumption that if you're watching this and you're looking for this perspective, you believe the scriptures are God breathed, they're inerrant. That's not the point of this video. I'm just going to make that assumption. It's very clear that God commands the death penalty in Old Testament law. The whole of Old Testament law is based on a very simple principle when it comes to punishments anyway. It is that the crime should fit the punishment or the punishment should fit the crime. It goes that way around. The punishment fits the crime. So you get an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and you also get a life for a life if that life is taken intentionally. That is very clearly God's standard. It's nothing more than that. It's also nothing less 
than that, less than that is also injustice, just as more than that would be. Now, some of you are likely to say something along the lines that, okay, well, that's the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law no longer applies in this way. Like, maybe it applies morally, doesn't apply legally. That's a big topic, different video, worth doing at some point. Not the point of this one. All I want to ask is the following. When you say that, are you saying that God was wrong? Did God change his mind, right? Do you, are you saying that God in the Old Testament was immoral when he demanded that to be the punishment? Because it sounds a lot like that. It sounds like what you're saying is that God realized he was probably incorrect, went on some big spiritual journey, some quest for enlightenment, did DMT, sat down with a shaman, and then figured out how special and wonderful violent child murderers are deep down and decided that what he had said back then doesn't really matter. Because if you're saying it's immoral, then that is the claim that you're making. Now, some of you will then push back on that and you'll say, well, Jesus opposed the death penalty because Jesus in Matthew 5 says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, don't resist anyone who is evil. So a couple of things on this. Firstly, if this is about preventing murders, then you actually need to take that whole do not resist thing the whole way down. If that's what this is applying to, then there's a few things you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to physically intervene to stop someone stabbing. You're not allowed to push the person away, hold them down, wrestle the knife off them. They shouldn't even go to jail. Like jail would be a violation if that is what this is talking about. If that is your stance, at least you're consistent. You're consistently an idiot. Congratulations on that. It's very clear that that's not the subject at hand and it's not the stance that most people take. Jesus in this passage is warning against unforgiveness. He's warning against personal vengeance, which is a real problem. But what he's not speaking to are the legal codes for a just society. Also, just prior to this, he has made it very clear that every single pen stroke in the Old Testament is entirely valid. He is abrogating none of it. He is just telling us how it applies and how it doesn't. So it applies legally, but you can't pull that over into personal revenge. Romans 13 would back this point up, by the way. It says that the government has the power of the sword. That implies that you don't. So, yeah, you can maybe defend yourself. That's quite valid. But you are not permitted to be an executioner. That is reserved for the role of government. Okay, what about John 8 and the woman caught in adultery? Well, a couple of things on that. There needed to be witnesses and there needed to be two witnesses. We don't actually know if there were two witnesses. That's not the claim that's made here. But also... All of those witnesses disappear. Now, in the Old Testament law, the witnesses were to be the first ones to cast the stone. That's very interesting. Based on what Jesus says, the let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Jesus, in this passage, is not setting aside Old Testament criminal punishment. He is actually very carefully keeping it. He's being very precise. He was not a witness. He could and should do nothing about it. And there was no witness there to carry out the punishment. What he's not saying is that this was an unjust or inappropriate punishment. And people will push back with a sort of more practical, spiritual reason at this point. They'll say, well, what about if they get saved in jail? I was actually asked this question by a non-Christian, literally had just met him and and he heard I was a pastor and he told me one of his big wrestles with the faith, which was that there had been a serial murderer in his area, went to jail, came to faith, came out now living a good life. And he was like, what do you do about that? And I said, well, quite honestly, I think the death penalty should apply. I think that would be the biblical standard. I said, now we live in a society that doesn't follow that, has no interest in that, in which case definitely better to change and become a Christian and live a good life. But legally, the right thing would be to face the consequences of his actions. I would say to someone like that, great that you come to Jesus. We're still going to organize the meeting very soon. And the non-Christian guy was actually really impacted by this. He almost was ready to come to faith. He was like, I'm going to check out your channel. What church do you go to? All of this stuff. Because he saw the rightness of biblical justice. So I would say if there's that kind of scenario that goes on in our broken justice system and afterwards people, you know, maybe come to faith and they go and live fruitful lives or they have ministry in jail and God is using them, we praise God for that. If that's the case, you're fortunate, right? Make the most of the life you've been given. 
But it doesn't mean that the justice system made the correct call. I would argue that what we would want to do in a scenario with a death penalty is spend the time between sentencing and execution pleading with that person to come to Christ. Not so that they can get out of the punishment, but because that punishment is going to be carried out and we want them to avoid an eternal punishment. So there you go. That's the whirlwind case for the death penalty. If we want murderers to stop laughing in court, I think we should bring it back. Sorry for that more downbeat video. I couldn't do the jokes on this topic. Just, as I said, hit near to home. Struggled through that one. If I'd done it more theoretically, I could have, but I felt I wanted to speak about this. A reminder, please, everybody, about the families. Go fund me. Bless them. Tell them you're praying for them. If you like this video, tap it. We are contraminimum.com. You can pick up a t-shirt. Check out everything on Clear Truth Media. If you are looking for a more upbeat video, this one will do.